Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Carroll. I'm the director of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property here at American University, Washington College of Law. Delighted to see so many of you in the room, and hello to everyone in cyberspace. Um, we're here to talk about um, a very significant uh, litigation between uh, Samsung and Apple regarding a number of uh, components of the, the smartphones that they are both uh, producing and that we are actively consuming. Um, before we get into the substance of the program, I, I, I know we have a number of 1Ls um, who uh, we have not get, had a chance to introduce the program to, so let me do that for a moment now. Um, the IP program here at, at WCL is an extremely active uh, program that offers a wide range of classes in all the different branches of intellectual property. Um, the standard four that are often referred to are patents, copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, and in addition, there are a range of other bodies of law that all get lumped under the, the title of intellectual property. Um, and this body, these bodies of law have come to be increasingly economics, economically significant as we rely on innovation and creativity as the source of our uh, continued economic growth. And this case is a clear example of the amount of money and the, and the amount of value associated with intellectual property. Um, in addition to our normal academic offerings, we also are one of the first law schools to ha have launched an intellectual property clinic, um, and that remains an ongoing. It just uh, celebrated its 10th year. Um, and like this event, uh, we um, are a very active program in producing extracurricular gatherings of all sorts. Uh, we'll be having a gathering to discuss more about uh, what our course offerings are and op opportunities to work with the program. We do hire research assistants, and so if you have an interest in working with us, uh, you should signal that. If we don't know who you are, um, we have a sign-up sheet, and it would be very helpful if you sign one of these so that we can contact you and communicate with you. Um, this is Sean Flynn, our uh, associate director, um, and Meredith Jacob, our assistant director. If you see them around the law school, uh, all pidgin related questions are welcome. Uh, to my immediate left uh, is um, Jonas Anderson. Anderson, uh, who teaches patent law, trade secrets, and for the 1Ls, he also teaches property. Next to him is Professor Christine Farley. She teaches trademark, international trademark, and a 1L elective that introduces the, the uh, survey of intellectual property law. And to her left is George uh, Contreras. Professor Contreras teaches um, <clears throat> intellectual property licensing, uh, law and science, and he also teaches first-year property. So there's a, uh, what is a one-third chance that one of your property professors is sitting at this table. Um, so we're very uh, uh, glad that we were able to put this uh, event together quickly. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to ask Professor Contreras to explain a little bit about what this case is about and how it fits into the larger struggle over the smartphones. Uh, after that, we'll hear from Professor Anderson about the design patents in the case and Professor Farley about the uh, trade secret claims. So off to you. <clears throat> Great. Thanks very much. So any of you who have been listening to the news over the last few weeks undoubtedly have heard about the, uh, the legal battles between Apple and Samsung and many other companies in the telecommunications space. Uh, we're focusing on the, the jury verdict that came out last Friday. Um, in the Apple-Samsung case, but be aware this is just one episode in a much larger uh, set of what are called patent wars that have been going on between these companies and many other companies in the space, and they generally surround the dispute around the Android operating system, which Google produced. You see, Google isn't actually a party in this case, but is quite uh, interested and closely involved with other related cases um, as Apple, with its uh, iPhone, <clears throat> excuse me, an iPad technology, which uses a proprietary operating system, uh, decided to challenge uh, Google's Android operating system on a variety of legal theories when it came out. Um, and as you probably all know, the well-known uh, complaint of Apple founder Steve Jobs was that Android ripped off uh, the Apple operating system, and he was going to expend all possible resources at Apple to uh, to fight this uh, this ripoff. And so that leaves us today 
with a series of probably 50 different uh, court battles around the world uh, among different companies. Um, the battle between Apple and Samsung is being fought in 10 different countries, uh, at least formally, uh, the U.S., also the U.K., Germany, Japan, uh, Italy, Australia, and Korea. Um, and we've already started to get some judgments in a number of these. The one that came out in California last week was by no means the first. <clears throat> um, there was uh, an earlier judgment uh, in the U.K. that was uh, uh, kind of mixed. But, but really, if, if you're following, following what the disputes are, they are essentially about what the iPhone and the iPad look like, and we'll talk about that in much more detail, how those are protected legally, what they look like, how they operate, um, and what the overall, since the products are. Uh, in the UK, uh, the ruling was essentially against Apple. Uh, the court found that the Apple products were much cooler, uh, to quote the, uh, the court, much cooler than the Samsung products, and therefore Samsung couldn't be held to be infringing them. Um, a German court, though, disagreed in, in a German court uh, in the same, you know, between the same parties. Apple did get an injunction against sales of Samsung products, certain products to a certain degree. Uh, just last week, uh, the court, uh, district court in Seoul, Korea, uh, gave a mixed verdict, ruled for both Apple and Samsung on various patents and issued injunctions against both of their sales in South Korea. So we're left in the U.S. with, uh, you know, or we look in the U.S. at this uh, very complex international patchwork of cases. Um, had a three three week trial in uh, San Jose in the federal district court, uh, resulted in a jury verdict um, Friday in the evening. It was uh, live blogged uh, by many different sources. You could watch it. It was exciting. Uh, it was like uh, watching the returns come in in, a, in an election. Um, as the verdict was read uh, piece by piece. So we're going to split up this discussion into a few parts. Right? First, Professor Anderson will talk about the design patents in the case. There are two kinds of patents in the U.S., design patents and utility patents. And he'll discuss some of the differences between those. Bear in mind, that distinction does not exist elsewhere in the world. Designs are protected in many different ways. Professor Farley is then going to talk about some of the trade dress trademark type protections that were litigated in the suit. And then I will talk a little bit about the utility patents. Both Apple and Samsung asserted utility patents against each other, and the results were very interesting. Then after that, there are a few larger issues and a few things that are still to come in this case. Number one, the issue of willfulness. As you may know, the billion-dollar verdict that was handed down in San Jose can actually be multiplied by up to three based on a finding that Samsung willfully violated Apple's patents. And that's up to the judge, and she has not uh, heard arguments or ruled on motions to that effect yet. There's also the question of whether an injunction will issue in this case, preventing Samsung from selling products uh, that infringe the patents. There's a hearing that will be held on the injunction question in a few weeks. We'll talk about that briefly. And finally, something that probably is on everyone's mind, is what this is going to do in terms of settlement discussions between the parties. And we can just wildly guess and speculate about that, but that's what we're good at, isn't it? So uh, with that, turn it over to Professor yeah. Anderson. And I, I want to just make one teaching point for the uh, student. It, you heard Professor Contreras list all of those legal disputes, um, and the courts are disagreeing, and you might ask, how can that be? Patents are territorial rights, and so the, the rights being sued on are the patents that were issued by the relevant authorities in each of those countries. So although the issues are the same, the technologies are the same, the legal standard may vary slightly, and the legal judgment can be based on the territorial law. And so we might end up with a patchwork of results where it's legal to sell Samsung products in some markets and enjoined in others, because that is the nature of the territorial right, nature of intellectual property rights. Great. So as Professor Contreras said, I'm going to be talking about the design patents today. Um, so for those in my patent class, we've had two classes, and we are already done with design patents. They're almost worthless in normally in the U.S. Shoe companies are interested in them. Virtually no one else is. But in this litigation, it has become a huge issue, and probably the biggest issue, and I think the most interesting legal issue in this case are the design patents. If there's anything that's going to go to the Supreme Court in this case, it's the design patents. So um, this is a 
small portion of the jury verdict form. So what the jury had to do in this case was take this form, list, it had a list of all the Samsung products, all the different patents, and basically say yes or no, does this infringe? So this is one example of maybe 13 different things they had to fail. It's an incredibly complex case. I think we'll have to turn them off, actually. Okay, so here's, oh, I'm getting conflicting instructions. That's the best we can do. If I can deal with, okay. You probably can't see it at all. Okay, I'll talk, I'll talk you through it. Paint a picture in words. Right, so this is, in a picture you can't see, a graph of what happens in this case. So above this line, which you also can't see, are the Samsung phones. Below them are the iPhones. So iPhones are very distinct. They're only three or four or five. They all look the same. Samsung makes a million different products, okay? Here is what Apple wants you to think happened in this case. These are the Samsung phones before the iPhone. Here's the iPhone. And here are the Samsung phones after the iPhone, right? Looks clear, they clearly copied Apple, right? That is, that's essentially Apple's case, argument in this case. And it was an effective one. They won on that. Here's another of the same sort of graphics, right? These are Samsung phones before the iPhone. They look like Blackberries. They have keyboards. They have antennas, things that we don't use anymore. After the iPhone, they all look very similar to Apple, right? So the question in this case is, has Samsung infringed the design, or one of the questions, has Samsung infringed the design patents that Apple had? Here's one of Apple's design patents. Design patents are very simple. The only thing you need to know in a design patent is whether the lines are straight or dashed. That's really all that matters. So these dashed lines here aren't actually any legal rights. These solid lines are where you declare your design. You're declaring that I claim the design only in the strong lines. The dashed line is just to help you see the entire phone, right? So in this example, what they're claiming is essentially the design of the front of the iPhone. It's essentially a rectangle with curves on the corners, right? Not that complex. And it's sort of a solid black cover, okay? So if we're looking at whether Samsung infringed this, here are the ones that the jury said yes. These phones infringe this design. They all have this sort of same design. They have a rounded rectangle. It's glossy and black on the front. But it's a complex decision. Here's the one they said did not infringe, right? Same sort of thing. It's rounded. It's got the same speaker phone the other ones do. They look very similar, right? But the jury decided that this one on the bottom was not infringed and the one on the top was. And it's all based on whether they have copied the claimed elements in this design patent, okay? Another example. Here you can see Apple's not claiming the front design. They're claiming this little bevel, which is this right here, right? The little divide, I'm going to use this product demonstration, right? From the screen to the side, there's a little bevel. It's not just a sharp corner. That's all they're claiming in this design patent, right? So again, the jury had a fairly complex decision. They said these were infringing and these ones were not. All right, so if we really look at these pictures, which is all the jury's doing, it's pretty complex to figure out why these ones did not infringe and why those ones above did. I can make some guesses. We don't really know from the jury. All the jury said was yes or no. All right, so here's the big, I think, shocker and the only win for Samsung in this case. So Apple has a patent on the design of the iPad, right? Samsung is introducing a new tablet, which is supposed to be their big product. It's, I've heard, I've read on these gadget websites that it's as good, if not better, than the iPad. It has a better camera. It can do just about everything the iPad can and maybe more for a third of the price. This one costs about 200. The iPad's still around 600. So this is what Apple is really worried about in this case, or one of the things they're really worried about. But the jury in this case said that this was a non-infringing device. So the one thing Samsung can take away from this case is that this tablet did not infringe the Apple iPad. Okay, last thing. Here is a brief summary of the damages in this case. And you can see that the jury had to go back a couple times and fix a few errors, right? A few hundred million dollar errors, 70 million dollar errors here and there. You can see right here that the tablet, 
they initially gave them $300,000, but as I said, they also found that that was non-infringing, so the judge said, well, you can't actually have damages when it's non-infringing, they sent it back. So there have been a lot of recalculations going on as the lawyers really go through this. But I, sh I show you this just to show how complex this decision was and how complex this case was, and they decided all of this in about three hours. Okay, um, last point. Two and a half days. Two and a half days. Um, regardless, for each one of those, it's, it's pretty quick. Um, okay, last thing. The jury decided that none of these patents were invalid, which means that all the patents, the design patents that Apple had were valid. They hadn't been precluded by something that came before it. So here's just a, a picture I like to show. All we're doing with dealing with is pictures here. This tablet above is the Hewlett Packard tablet in 2002. It wasn't a big seller. I'm sure none of you have it. Um, <laughs> but it looks surprisingly similar to the iPad patent, which came after Hewlett Packard. <laughs> so the jury said there's enough difference here that we can give this patent. But then uh, Samsung's devices are similar enough that they infringe. So all of this is, um, it's very difficult to see how they made these distinctions. They don't have to tell us what they did, just that these were valid and not infringed. So all of this will be appealed, um, but essentially these sort of patents cost Apple uh, probably over a billion, you think, just for the design? Maybe not over a billion, but close to a billion dollars just for the design. Do you know the... Oh, to actually come up with the designs, right? Oh, yeah. Patents cost nothing. Right, patents, well, <laughs> virtually nothing, right, right. So Apple's real argument in this case is that their design was, was preeminent here and that Samsung stole that. That's what they wanted you to know. What they didn't want you to know and what they won on was that maybe they weren't the first one to come up with this design in the first place. Great. And can I insert a couple of little teaching points there? So one is we're the only country in the world that would impanel a jury to make this decision. And, and the reason uh, every other country that uh, would deal with a civil case like this would make it a judicial decision. The reason we have a jury in a case like this is actually based in the Constitution. The Seventh Amendment of the Constitution guarantees a jury trial for all causes of action that had juries at, at, the, t at the relevant time in 1789. So for those of you, one else, who are going to be taking constitutional law, you'll spend maybe a minute <laughs> on the Seventh Amendment. But it ends up being a really big deal because who your decision maker is and the big grounds for the decision are quite different. Um, so so that's, that, that's the main uh, point there. Anyway. Yeah, well, <laughs> on, on that, let me just illustrate with some uh, some some graphical illustrations. So, the jury, this was a complicated case. They were out for two and a half, for three and a half days, something like that. Um, but the jury verdict sheet, which they have to fill out by hand, is literally a 20-page long document. And you can see what it looks like. It's got every Samsung product along one line. And then at the top, it's got things like, you know, if you found that Samsung blah, blah, blah infringed, you know, claim 50 of patent XYZ, then, you know, proceed with this analysis. And uh, that goes on for 20 pages. But to guide them, they weren't without any guidance. To guide them, they had a 109-page set of jury instructions this that they were supposed to read that told them how to answer these uh, 20 pages worth of questions. Um, and uh, undoubtedly, that, that led them to all the results that we're hearing. A young man back there has a question. Did one of the parties request a jury? Which one? Apple. Apple did. Apple. Yeah. You have to demand, you have to exercise your Seventh Amendment right and actually demand it. So for those of you taking civil procedure, you'll, you'll learn that. And what uh, Professor Contreras just held up is called a special verdict where in order for appellate purposes to be more clear about what the jury's decision was, by asking those specific questions, it will clarify the record for the inevitable set of appeals. Okay, without any further ado. The, the, request, the request was made in, in Apple's 350-page complaint <laughs> and, uh, and uh, demand for jury. Professor Farley, what the heck is trade dress? Well, let me start by saying, and I feel like I'm interjecting myself in this already, but um, this is called the patent case of the century, um, which always ruffled my feathers because it's a trademark case. I don't know why. The only the only thing I can think of is that as far as trademark law goes, this is not important. So that says something about uh, trademark law and patent law in terms of coolness. You know, if the legal question is which is cooler, this is just a run-of-the-mill trademark case. Um, in fact, the first six claims in that thick complaint were trademark claims. So they started with their trademark case, Apple did, in their complaint. Um, and most of what they're asserting, much of what they're asserting in their trademark claims 
is identical to what they're asserting in their trade dress claims. That is, they're not focused on different features. It's the same design features put forth under two theories of law. And so I'm really fascinated with this case in terms of how these pieces fit together and what the effect is. Because although I think really what they want to protect could be protected under trademark law, and they thought so too because they claimed it all, when I've since read about the jury verdict and, in fact, some interviews with jurors, the jurors, you know, how did they get through? How did they get through all those documents and all those questions? They were impressed with kind of tangible registered evidence. You know, so those diagrams, I think, became pretty important to the jury in ways maybe they didn't need to be, that the law was probably stronger in theory, in argument, in their claims, but that the fact of the patents, this is the patent case of the century, seemed to have some impact, although the really interesting questions were in trademark law. And trademark case of the century. It's just a trademark case. Just one of very many trademark cases. Okay, so I'm going to, I didn't make any slides. I just want to show you the pictures in the complaint. So within the complaint, the complaint isn't actually that long. Mostly what's long is the appendix of all the patents in the case. But as I say, they start the case with their trademark claims. Is this mic on? Should I put it on? And they demonstrate the same case that Professor Anderson just demonstrated for you in trademark. So here is a picture of what they're claiming is their trade dress. And something that has maybe been new and informational to people who even know a lot about intellectual property law is that you can register trade dress. And so there were registrations. There were these tangible pieces of paper that meant something to the jury in trade dress as well. And so they put forth three registered designs, which is under trademark law as well. So the trademark office had already accepted these designs. And I'll tell you what these designs cover. One registration covers a rectangular shape with rounded corners, silver edges, black face, and 16 colorful icons. That's a registration. Another registration is for a rectangular handheld mobile digital electronic device with rounded corners. Another registration is for a rectangular handheld mobile digital electronic device with a gray rectangular portion in the center, black band above and below the gray rectangular on the curved corners, and a silver outer border and sides. We're familiar with this design. We know what they're talking about. But there were registered trademarks or trade dress in this case. In their case that they put forward, they were a little bit more specific about what they're claiming in terms of what's functioning as a trademark for Apple here in terms of what this device looks like. They claim a rectangular product shape with all four corners uniformly rounded, the front surface of the product dominated by a screen surface with black borders. As to the iPhone and iPod touch products, substantial black borders above and below the screen, having roughly equal width and narrower black borders on either side. As to the iPod products, substantial black borders being roughly equal in width on all sides. A metallic surround framing the perimeter of the top surface. A display of a grid of colorful square icons with uniformly rounded corners and a bottom row of square icons, the springboard set off from the other icons that do not change as the other pages of the interface are viewed. I actually read that description to my 10-year-old. And I asked, you know, what do you think? And he has an iPod touch, and we have a Samsung Galaxy phone in our family and an iPhone in our family, so he's familiar with the products. And he said his reaction was, yeah, right. And so me being the Socratic method law professor, I said, and by yeah, right, do you mean that you don't think these are valid claims, that, you know, that Apple shouldn't own that design? And his response was, yes. And being the lawyer that he is at age 10, he said, here are my four reasons. Number one, you know, a rectangular shape, all phones are rectangular. Number two, 
rounded corners. Of course they need to be rounded. You're slipping it in and out of your pocket. That's going to make it easier. So, of course, it needs to be rounded. Number three, black on the bottom and the top. Of course, you need to direct your attention to the center to see the icons. Number four, colorful icons. Of course, you need to be able to see them quickly. So, you know, if Apple owns that, then how can other iPhones exist? So he really, he should, you know, uh, Samsung should have, fought, should have fought for somebody like that on the jury, I think, because he, <laughs> he, was, he was focused on this, this sense of competition that um, Samsung is trying to put forth. Um, and I think, to a certain extent, you know, there are these particular features which added up together represent their trademark, their trade dress here. But any, any particular one is not so very exciting or distinctive. I think the jury was blown away by the demonstration that Professor Anderson did for you, which is to show the before and after of what the Samsung phone looked like. Um, in addition to that, um, and this I think is, is interesting and, and nobody has focused on so far, there were um, additional set of trade dress claims by Apple against, against Samsung, and that was for the packaging of the product. So they claimed a trademark just in the box and the way it was um, presented, and I have that in the complaint as well. And when you get back, can you help us understand what does it mean for trade dress to be distinctive? When when Apple claims all of those things, what are they showing? Most complaints are not this cool, by the way. Okay. So here's, uh, here's just it's filed by Apple, Apple. But they also have in this complaint pictures of the packaging for the iPad. Um, so they're claiming, and I can read it, these are, these are the dimensions, a rectangular box with minimal metallic silver lettering and a large front view picture of the product prominently on the top surface of the box, a two-piece box wherein the bottom piece is completely nested in the top piece, and a use of a tray that cradles the product to make them immediately visible upon opening the box. Yeah, right? Um, so, and you can see that here. So the, it's, it's very simplistic. It's very minimal. They're really pushing the idea of accessibility, right? This is a very special purchase you've just made. It's very cool and new and you don't even need the directions which are hidden underneath that nesting tray, right? So it was fairly innovative, their packaging. But they can claim that in trademark law. They can register that in trademark law. And they're asserting it against um, Samsung, which we just quickly went over, has somewhere in this complaint. Um, and that's the iPad box. I'll show you Samsung's box. And when they register that, they're saying that you as the consumer look at that box and you know it's an Apple box because it's distinctive. It's not just any old box. It comes from a particular producer. So you can see here the matte black, the metallic writing. Um, they don't have the picture of the product on the box the way Apple does. But when you open the box, you see the product and nothing else. It's nested. Um, so, so they're claiming that as an infringement as well. Um, also, what I scrolled over very quickly is they're claiming trademarks in the icon, the icons that you know and love. Um, so the icon for your contacts, the icon to use the phone, the icon to send a text message, um, of course the icon for uh, iTunes. Um, these are trademarks, trademarks, not trade dress. These are trademarks that they're asserting against um, Samsung uh, for photos, that, that flower, um, for your uh, settings, notes, contacts, music. Um, and if I scroll, you'll see Samsung's. I need an assistant. Here we go. Okay, so... That's Samsung's icon. Uh, yeah. Um, is that the same thing that I, I was under the impression that those were aspects of Google Android, not necessarily independent Samsung? That these particular, that these these images on the on the uh, mm -hmm. these are not created by Samsung. Well, I, that's, that's the impression. I don't know. I don't know that 
it doesn't matter. And yeah. Samsung is still there's Samsung, Samsung, Samsung using product. So. Yeah. I don't know how they're developed. But um, you know, they're different. Um, but you know, it's a notepad, it's a notepad, it's brown and it's yellow. They're very similar. The phone is very similar, it's very simple. The I can um, sorry, the contacts seem to have the same idea of a head and shoulders profile. So they're similar. So so there's that aspect as well. So these are all the trademark claims. Um, all right, so to, to the legal questions that Michael wants me to address. Um, so what do they have to prove? They have to prove that this trade dress packaging icon um, are all distinctive, um, that they connote source to users, um, that they uh, have secondary meaning because except for the packaging, this is the product and the law requires that you show <laughs> that consumers regard these design features like that apple on the back. Right When I see this, a product like this with these design features, it's as good as putting that apple on. It tells me who made it. It tells me where it comes from. Um, you have to prove that it's non-functional. So those were the concerns that my son raised. You know, Is it a functional aspect to have a nice round corner? Is that a design aspect that we want Apple to monopolize, or do we want others who compete in this product space to be able to share that design aspect? Um, you have to prove confusion. That And one of my students who's here said to me that when she passed her Samsung phone to a friend, the friend immediately tried to click on the circle on the bottom because they thought it was uh, an iPhone. That would be an instance of confusion. Because of the design aspects, they thought that it, was, uh, it came from a different source. In this case, they proved dilution. Uh, in order to prove trademark dilution, you have to prove that the mark is famous. Um, this is pretty easy for a, for a company like Apple. So just to let you know, and you really don't need to know, you already know, um, I have some information here about the, oh, okay. Um, between 2007 and 2011, uh, 60 million iPhones were sold. Um, between 2010 and 2011, 19 million iPads were sold. And uh, Apple has spent $2 billion in advertising. And you know that they're advertising the shape and the look of these things. So these kind of facts suggest that this design is famous. Um, now, what the, what the um, interestingly, what the jury did with all of this, again, along the lines that, you know, is there a patent, is there a registered trademark, they really relied too much, I think, on these documents. So for the registered um, iPhone designs, um, the jury said, yes, they're famous, and yes, they're diluted. For the unregistered combination iPhone designs, in which they weren't really saying 3G or any particular phone, they said, no, they're not famous. Um, so there were 16 phones at issue, and they said, as a result, six of the 16 phones were diluted by uh, Samsung, the various phones that Professor Anderson showed you. Um, Interestingly, they got to the exact same conclusion in terms of the unregistered marks. Six out of 16 still infringe, so that doesn't quite add up for me. Um, okay, and then we'll talk about willfulness and stuff later. Okay, great, thanks. So even though this is a trademark case, um, there are still <clears throat> some patent issues to finish talking about. So for those of you who have taken any patent course, a survey, Professor Anderson's course, 99% uh, of the patents that you will talk about and that are discussed in the cases are what are called utility patents. Those are patents that cover inventions, not designs. And believe it or not, despite all of the design uh, overtones in this case, there were some utility patents asserted by each party, right? These were Samsung's patents, uh, the only patents that Samsung was able to muster up to assert against Apple. So Apple asserted a number against Samsung, um, by the time of the jury verdict and the trial, um, there were only three that were being asserted against Samsung, and the jury found Samsung infringed all three, um, but they were for things that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be covered by patents, right? It wasn't the internal workings of the iPhone, the way the circuitry worked, the way the, uh, the very cool glass and uh, sensor technology works. Um, they were for three particular things. Um, claim 19 of the 381 patent deals with bounce back. So when you touch a document and you slide it over toward the edge, it kind of bounces against the edge, right, and then springs back. Some call it the rubber banding, some call it 
bounce back. That's covered by this claim of this patent. The second patent, uh, the 163 patent, claim number 50, which uh, went to verdict, um, was for tap to center. Right? You tap a document and it kind of goes to the center of the screen. And then the uh, the third patent that was sort of the 915 patent, um, claim number eight, related to scrolling with your finger and what's called pinch to zoom. You move your fingers like that and the document gets bigger on the screen. Right? These are not complex electromechanical. Um, they, they, there's some question, a uh, question has been raised about whether you even can patent these sorts of things. And in the inevitable appeal that we're going to see here, uh, undoubtedly there will be some questions about the patentability of these types of things. But when you, you hear about them, they sound simple. When you read the patent claims, they're act, they actually sound very complicated. So tap to center, I'm just going to read you a few lines from a much lengthier patent claim. So you've got a portable electronic device with a touch screen display and all this other stuff. And so in response to detecting the second gesture, the structured electronic document is translated so that the second box is substantially centered on the touch screen display. I don't have any pictures to show you. I, as I said, I'm painting a picture with the, uh, the words of this claim. Um, believe it or not, that means you tap the screen and the document is centered. So the jury found that all of these patents were valid um, and that Samsung infringed all of the claims with most of its devices. Um, and that will feed into the damages analysis. Now, Samsung also had some patents, right? You would be a fool if you're a big company like Samsung not to come find some of your own patents when you're sued with patents. And Samsung actually claimed 300 uh, plus million dollars in damages from Apple. Uh, the jury found that, Samsung, that Apple infringed none of Samsung's patents, which was interesting, right? Samsung's patents were a lot more technological than Apples, right? So things, there were five patents that Samsung ultimately asserted a trial, about seven claims of them. Um, one of them uh, actually is something quite useful, right? Playing music while doing other tasks, a multitasking patent. Um, one of them involved bookmarking a photo in a photo gallery while capturing a new photo, another kind of multitasking patent. And another one was about um, sending email um, uh, with a message and a photo from a photo gallery, right? Useful things, things that, you know, I can do with my iPhone. I'm, I'm curious how the jury verdict came out as it did, but uh, it did. The other two patents that Samsung asserted were quite interesting because they really related to wireless data communication. Uh, they're patents that affected the Intel chips that were inside of the iPhone. So somebody asked, well, you know, with these icons, Samsung didn't design those. Those were part of the Android operating system. And that's right. But if you license an operating system from somebody and you put it in your phone and it's infringing, you're making, using, or selling in the United States, you're liable for patent infringement. If Google didn't have a license from Apple, and it obviously didn't, then... Apple could have sued Google, but it could also sue anybody else who's using the Android system. Same thing with the um, the processors that Intel sold. Um, they cover wireless data communication standard, the UMTS 3G standard, which is in every mobile phone. Uh, the interesting thing about this is the jury said, well, Apple didn't infringe those patents. Yet, you can make a phone call using your iPhone. So if you can make a phone call using your iPhone and iPhone uses the UMTS standard, which it does, Samsung's patents are what are called standards essential patents. Now you might dispute whether or not they're actually essential to the standard, but nobody really was disputing that. You would think that if Apple is enabling you to make phone calls using the UMTS network, then their phones might be infringing. Now, that doesn't mean that Apple is going to be liable necessarily for that infringement because Apple, of course, bought those chips from Intel, who did have a license. And so the jury also found that the patents were exhausted, right? And exhausted means that Apple got the uh, infringing product from somebody who was licensed. So unlike Android and the icon shapes, um, Intel and Qualcomm and other manufacturers of communications chips all do have licenses and generally when you buy a chip from them, you're safe because a patent holder can only take a toll once 
on any given patent. But this, this case is very interesting in terms of utility patents because you've got a strange verdict around the standards essential patents. You have kind of a strange verdict around the other Samsung liability utility patents. And when you look at the jury verdict form, you know, it's one of these, here, here it is for Samsung's utility patents. You know, it's complicated. It's got all of these, it's got the iPhone and the iPad and all of these patents listed across the top with the different claims. And if you, and it asks, you know, for each of the following products has Samsung proven by a preponderance of the evidence that Apple infringed the indicated Samsung utility patent claims. And there's a little N in every box. And that's kind of the end of the story. So, you know, you wonder, fatigue, overload of information, it's a little hard to tell. But in any case, that's where we are with the utility patents. So before we open for questions, one other point about the field of intellectual property. You saw the good-natured joshing between the patent lawyers and the trademark lawyer. I should also say, copyright plays a role in this overall struggle. So there was a separate case between Oracle and Google over the Android software that involved copyright claims, but was also an attack on the Android system and could have resulted in an injunction that would have had an impact on the smartphone market. That particular case fizzled out. But for those of you who are thinking about the intellectual property field, I do want to emphasize you do not need a technical degree to enter the field. Trademark, copyright are for everyone. And in fact, many of the aspects of patent litigation are conducted by non-specialists, non-technical specialists. If you think about it, if someone has a degree in chemical engineering, exactly how much better situated are they than someone else to do a computer software case, right? Patent cases sometimes involve very technical facts, and those degrees help you understand whether the lawyer is competent to understand the facts. But as Professor Contreras just said, the patents at issue were relatively simple. You know, anyone with an appetite for learning the facts could have learned those. So with that, I'd love to hear questions from the floor in the back, sir. I have a question. Do any of the patents that were asserted against the buyer, against either party, were any of those purchased? You know, everyone's been going to buy a patent from other companies. I don't believe so, no. I think in the iPhone, the initial patents for the pinching and the spreading were purchased. They were initially developed by, I know this from reading the Steve Jobs biography, from a Delaware company. They were the first ones. So that when they went into the phone business, the first thing they did when they abandoned their track wheel phone idea was to go purchase patents. But not for this litigation. Right. They may not have been the three that were at issue here. So this is a good point Joe makes. And another interesting, all these patents are licensed and sold. And, you know, you shouldn't think that Apple invented everything they're claiming and that Samsung invented everything they're claiming. A lot of it is bought and sold from different people. And even Apple licenses a lot of the design patents I showed, right? So Microsoft, they've licensed a lot of their design patents to Microsoft. With the caveat that Microsoft can't get too close to the iPhone design. So somewhere some attorneys have engaged in complex contracting around how much is too much copying. But you can use our patents. We won't sue you for infringement. So all of these things are very complex that are behind the scenes before the litigation ever happens. And so actually, so it also probably makes sense for us to spend just two minutes talking about the things to come in this case. And one thing that's very important is the injunctive relief hearing that's going to be held on September 20th. Because right now we've got a billion dollar verdict against Samsung. And we've, you know, potentially could be up to three times greater, you know, once the judge makes a ruling on willfulness, which we can also talk about. But one of the big deals in patent cases is often the injunction. That's almost what it's about. The damages are for past infringement. Everything that's happened up until today. What happens tomorrow will be determined in some part by the injunction ruling. And that could say Samsung can't sell, you know, XYZ products in the U.S. anymore, right? Which could be a very important thing. Now, and there are standards for injunctions. And we can, I'm sure you talk about the eBay case and so forth in various classes. One question that people have and that I have is what the effect of an injunction might actually be in this case. Even if Samsung were enjoined from selling every one of these products in the U.S., would that destroy 
the market. And, and uh, I was quoted in the Wall Street Journal this morning <laughs> sort of saying this already. I, I don't think this is the Android killer, right? Even if, even if an injunction is entered against every one of these products, the patents, the utility patents are easy to design around. They don't get to the fundamental functionality of the phone. The design patents, you know, you can change those icons. You could make them circles or polygons of some kind. Uh, you could you could square off edges, make the phone a little trapezoidal, make it thicker, thinner. There are many things you could do, and those types of redesigns are not that expensive in the grand scheme of the U.S. market for these devices. So I don't know. I don't necessarily think that this is the end of the world for Samsung, HTC, and Android phone makers. Yeah, so um, I, th I think that's right. I mean, the stock this morning dropped 7% for Samsung. So there has been a, I mean, people do think that this is, this is harmful. A billion dollars is like not right. small. Right. It's, you know, it's right. still something. Right, but that's more than a billion dollars that Mark kept this drop. So there's, there will be a delay and there will be products that can't be sold in the U.S. now, which, which this definitely impacts. So uh, it, if these trademark dilution claims stand, there should be an injunction that follows because the remedy for trademark dilution wouldn't be monetary. It would be an injunction against use. And one of the problematic features of a claim like that, unlike, I think, a little bit the trade dress claims where you have a design, you have a picture, you know what's ex precisely being claimed. These are a little bit looser. So when you talk about designing around those features, it, there's a real open question about how close you can get to a design. Is, is any rounded corner going to do? Um, is, you know, is any dark color background framing going to work? Um, I, I think... Um, one of the dangers, and maybe not going to kill the Android market, is a chilling effect because of the imprecision, at least in trademark claims, about how far you need to go to design around. And if you go too far, some of those design arounds can be unattractive for consumers or costly for designers. John? John? Yeah, it's ironic. I mean, the, the one, the one injunction, the preliminary injunction that actually issued was on the one product that they found not to infringe. But you know, the judge just guessed it wrong. And just to be clear, it didn't infringe the utility patent, the design patent, or the trade dress. So free and clear, the the tablet. It did infringe the, the utility. Oh, the the, the, the particular those particular functions. But there's nothing about the design of that tablet. It's not the design. Right. Um, basically, we spoke earlier about the uh, subjectivity of the jury and which claims that they found infringing or not. And meanwhile, in South Korea, they basically the same trial goes over and they find both Apple and Samsung to be infringing, although the amount that Apple has to pay Samsung is pennies. Like 22000 or $30,000, yeah. <laughs> A lot of subjectivity to like some people feel like you know this is you know a clear win, but I feel like it really is not. They, I feel like there's probably elements in this case that you know I don't feel were proven as more as just accepted. Well, I, I don't want to. Juries have a hard job, and this was a really hard job, right? And they took their time, and it's a very nuanced opinion. They didn't just say everything's good, everything's bad, right? They, they went through, it looks like, each device and gave it an N or a Y. Um, but, you know, you're going to get different results in different places. And, and one thing that's different is Korea doesn't have design patents, right? So that entire element that I talked about is gone from the Korean case. Um, but you're going to get different results in different places. That's the nature of having geographic rights uh, for IP. Yeah. One thing that that I think this all means is this: this would not be a bad time for the parties to settle, 
right? I mean, you've got injunctions issuing in different places. You've got different liability in different places. You know, what, what may have, so maybe Samsung can just take all of the infringing uh, galaxies from the U.S. and now sell them in, you know, Korea or the U.K. or other markets and then send the redesigned products. And that's, that's all very complicated. Um, it's going, you know, different ways in different, different countries. Um, the one nice thing that settlement would do in such a case is it would be a global settlement. Right, the parties could make peace. I mean, and Samsung is, by the way, still big, a big supplier for Apple um, in other areas. It's not like these companies uh, are out to destroy each other. Yeah, if I could just say two uh, things in response to the question. Um, like Professor Anderson said, I don't think there's trademark dilution protection in Korea, so those claims would have been gone as well. So maybe there's a legal reason why there's a difference. Um, I did read an interview with a juror, and of course I don't know if it's accurate, and I don't know whether the jurors, um, what, what he said represents how the jury was thinking, but he said that as to the unregistered trademark and trade dress claims, the jury felt like Apple was asking them to grant trademarks that they hadn't bothered to ask the trademark office to grant, and they were just not going to do that, which is, of course, completely wrong under the law. So if that's right, that's a, that's a completely wrong. Wow, lots of hands. Um, you, you had your hand up for a long time, and then... So, um, I mean, part of the reason they focused on it is because a lot of the IP rights we're talking about here are design rights, right? All the all of the design patents have they can't relate to functionality, right? If they do, they're not they're not um, you can't get. If you ask about Samsung, why didn't Samsung focus on that? Uh, the defense saying, "Oh, that these are functional." Uh, I mean, I think they did to some degree. You, 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 you kind of have to pick your battles when you're litigating, right? And so Apple's great story is, look, they copied, and Samsung has a number of, they can either say, no, we didn't, or copying is okay. Um, and they kind of went with the second one, right? Or Apple copied. Or Apple copied, right? The there, there are a lot of from Sony things. was there, one of their big and, and they went with the second one. I mean, I think it's easy to say this in hindsight, but one thing they could have done better, I think, was get was push their patents harder, right? And say, okay, well, if we're infringing these small patents you have, you're infringing these bigger patents we have, and we want even more money from you. And so it, that's what happens in a lot of patent cases, right? You just confuse the jury, and there's a lot of patents out there and a lot of technology, so why don't they just get along, right? So that's one thing they could have done that they did, but they could have pushed, I think, I think harder on that angle. But a lot of this is just litigation. You have to, you have to pick your battles. Two more. I'm going to take one and two in the back. Yeah, so, so the telecommunications standards patents are very interesting because Samsung didn't invent this stuff. Um, there are probably 30 companies that have patents on UMTS telecommunications uh, wireless standards because companies get together and, and make these, uh, you know, make these standards so all their products work together. Samsung is just one of many companies in that category. And, and something that the jury, you know, went over very, very quickly was whether Samsung violated obligations to license uh, those patents on what are called fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory, FRAND terms. 
um, they said Samsung didn't violate that obligation. But Samsung was obligated to license those. So if the jury found that Apple infringed those patents, which they didn't, uh, then they would also have to decide whether Apple was entitled to a license from Samsung, uh, even though the patents were also exhausted because Apple bought the chips from Samsung. But with standards like that, you're right. It, the whole market has to be able to use the technology. Otherwise, it's not a very good standard. Every phone, no matter who makes it, has to be able to use it. It's usually a question of how much royalty you pay. So there are companies who make a business of making new, you know, helping to make new telecommunication standards. They make billions of dollars by licensing their patents, but they have to license them. Um, they can't hold them back and keep people out of the market. Otherwise, it's not a good standard. <laughs> you can. You'd lose. Um, they're they're going to do a, a number of – I mean, they're going to go after the utility patents, say they're not even valid. Um, they shouldn't have been granted in the first place. Um, I think they'll do a similar thing with the design patents. Anticipation. Uh, Sony, others anticipated right. the design. So I think the big thing they'll do is they'll, they'll say what I said was a potential strategy going in, was saying these patents never should have issued in the first place. Right? Don't even look at infringement. Look at – and, yeah, let's just make it clear that it's one of the risks of asserting patents in litigation is that um, although the patent office made one determination and the trademark office made one determination, those are not the end answer. You can relitigate whether they made the right decision or not to grant the patent or grant the trademark registration. And so you put yourself at risk when you assert your IP rights like that. Um, but, you know... So the real advantage of that is that you knock out the patent. We don't have to do this game of which of these phones infringes this. The patent's gone. There's nothing to talk about. Um, and I think they will go after the law of design patents. You'll see some interesting legal arguments because it's a really um, not well-established law, and this grants a lot of money based on it, so they're going to ask for some stricter standards and maybe some pushback there. Yeah, and I think um – as I said, just from the just from the little things that I've learned about how the jury had to deal with this big case, I think they were too impressed with the issued documents from the patent office and the trademark office. And upon appeal, there's not going to there's not going to be any real benefit from that. Um, and in terms of this very simple design, I think that design patents are problematic because one of the elements is that it needs there needs to be some ornamental aspect of the design and um you know one the reason why this product is so popular is because there's no extra ornamental flourish it is scaled down to the most basic elements that produce an aesthetically pleasing experience but it's functionally driven so i think it's that's problematic especially for the design patents validity Oh, there's openings on all of the trademark claims, both on the validity of the trademarks, um, you know, whether they're functional, whether they're famous, uh, and also on the, the end questions about whether there's enough proof of confusion or dilution. Well, the law of dilution is, has always been in flux since we've had it. Um, there's not a, there's not so much law on um, product configuration, trademarks, dilution. There's some, but but it's it's even more in flux. It's 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 there's there's some. It's not quite a design patent, but um, it's not really a charted territory. I think we're we're out of here, right? Uh, because there's a uh, what? Okay, one more. Because I think there's a class at one. Uh, until two. Oh. Until two. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Well, so so the billion dollars or whatever it becomes is for retroactive damages, but it doesn't have to be paid right away. Um, Oh, from other people. So if they go back and make the argument in the appeals, you know what, X and Y patents should have been issued in the first place. Is that next to the message to go back and reverse money? No. 
That generally doesn't happen. No. But you lose – you obviously lose going forward. Going forward. But – but, right, other companies who weren't parties to the suit don't have to – don't have to repay when a patent is found invalid. They just don't pay going forward. And – and Samsung would not have to pay the full billion, right? Suppose, like, two out of Apple's whatever, seven patents were found invalid. That billion gets reduced in some way. And Samsung actually just has to post bond now until the appeals are exhausted. It doesn't have to pay the full billion until a final. All right. Last one. I think that argument is going to play best in the trademark claims because the trademark claims are not dependent on some proof you've made to an office and some document you have that you've successfully made the claim. But the claim is dependent upon how consumers view the claimed property. So in the case of when you see rounded edges, bezel, black screen, slim, shiny, whatever, you think Apple, right? That's the question that they need to prove. And to the extent people are more accustomed to seeing phones looking like this from all different sources, maybe they're not going to think Apple. So maybe it doesn't indicate source to them. And even if they had that property at one time, they may lose it. There's some question about at what time did people think what and when did they sue Samsung. But I think that our understanding of designs and products and do they communicate source or not, it does change over time. Okay. So with that, why don't we close. Thank you all so much for coming out. For more information about PIDGET, please visit our website. We'll be having an information session on 29th at 430 in the JD Lounge. So on Wednesday at 430, if you want to hear more about IP, what the course is, what the research opportunities are, please join us then. Thank you very much.